So welcome everyone to the Norwich Public Library. Uh, my name is Jillian Hinchliffe. I'm the Community Services Librarian here. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight Ham Gillette, who is the, this is a very long title, the Program and Outreach Coordinator for the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Management District. Uh, he has 12 years of experience in the solid waste and recycling industry from helping to start up a recycling and solid waste company in Woodstock to collecting field data and engaging in research for an internationally recognized solid waste consulting firm based in Windsor. He's spoken to numerous schools, businesses, and civic organizations about solid waste, hazardous waste, waste recycling, and compost issues. And he recently completed the UVM Extension Service Master Composter Course. Um, in addition to all of this, he also has a background as a professional actor and he officiates at weddings. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd put that in case I. A little advertising. So, you know, if, uh, yeah, if talk of solid waste and recycling gets anyone feeling romantic and they want to get married here tonight after that, I'm sure that uh, Camp can, yeah, help you out. Um, so I'm sure he welcomes all of your comments and questions, and I know that I'm very excited to hear what he has to say tonight. Please welcome me in, well, uh, please join me in welcoming Ham Duet. Yes, I am, that's what I do, I'm the Outreach Coordinator. And the Solid Waste District, I work for the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District. It runs from West Fairley down to Heartland, includes Bridgewater, Pomfret, Woodstock, Sharon, Thetford, Norwich, Heartland, um, Versher, West Fairley. I think I got them all. There are ten. Um, and I was at the Norwich Farmers, the Norwich um, Transfer Station earlier this summer. And I did run into somebody that I knew had moved from Heartland, and she said, "You know, we're all trying to do the right thing, but we're all so confused." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, okay. Well, maybe I need to come and give a presentation." So I called and. The rest is history, and I don't know where Carla is tonight, but uh, she's probably off traveling. Um, and then, coincidentally, I ran a hazardous waste collection this past Saturday in Woodstock for anybody in the district. And uh, I had never run one in Woodstock, and I anticipated about 75 people, and I got 170, wow. uh, which is great because obviously my outreach worked, but. Um, it was about 98% of the people who came through, and I spoke to every car, uh, they did not know about the new paint care initiative, they didn't know about the new battery recycling in Vermont, um, and those were the two main things that, that they were bringing. So I thought it was perfect, this is perfect timing, because I have a lot of, um, ideas in my head and I really do want to have questions presented to me. If I don't have an answer, I'll take your information and I'll get back to you because there are things that I don't know, believe it or not. Um, so I thought what I would do, um, first of all, I, there's one common misconception uh, that most people in this district have. And I always end up explaining on the phone, because we're being uh, taped tonight, I'm hoping that maybe I can get this word out to a few more people. Um, the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District and the Hartford Transfer Station are two completely separate entities. The town of Hartford used to be a member of the Greater Upper Valley District. They broke off and then they are their own district now. We work with them collaboratively collaboratively in many ways. All the member towns in this district can use the Hartford facility. When we have a hazardous waste collection in June, it's at the Hartford facility. But we, that's pretty much it. So if somebody calls me and says, um, may I bring 12 tires down at eight o'clock? I'll say, probably, but you ought to call the Hartford facility and ask. So I just wanted to get that, that straight. That seems to be everybody connects us in that way and we're, we are not. The, the office for Greater Upper Valley recently has moved from a little farmhouse in North Heartland down to um, a big beautiful old brick house in Escutney. And I share that um, building with Southern Windsor Wyndham County Solid Waste District and with the Southern Windsor Regional Planning Commission. So 
And yeah. what is that address, please? It, uh, the physical address is 38 Escutney Park Road. And we, I, I don't, I mean, I, I welcome people to come, but we're a little bit removed from the district. And um, we really, in terms of purchasing stickers and for your windshield and punch cards uh, for Hartford, we really encourage you to go to your town and clerk to do that and not not come to our office. We're just not set up for Is that. Is your phone number? Uh, eight oh two. I'm going to hand out a, a flyer okay. afterwards. Um, so let's begin. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Act One Forty Eight. Uh, which is the universal recycling law, and then I really do want to just, I don't want to give you the history, I just want to tell you how it affects all of us. Um, it is also called the universal recycling law. Um, the three main reasons, or the four main reasons for it being uh, legislated is that the recycling rate in Vermont, as in all over the country, is was stuck at about 35%. They're trying to boost it, they would like to boost it to 50 or 60. Um, the amount of recyclable, reusable materials that go into the landfill, uh, because they're, they're breaking down with no oxygen, they're anaerobically breaking down and they're creating enormous amounts of methane, which is adding to um, our carbon load. And when you drive by the Lebanon landfill, you see those pipes sticking up that's methane coming out. Um, so that's, that's another reason. And another reason is that Vermont only has one landfill left. It's up in Coventry, which is about 10 miles from Canada. It's owned by Casella Waste Management. And for, so your trash, uh, when you throw out a bag of trash, your trash is being transported almost to Canada to be thrown in a hole in the ground. Um, and when that is, it's a massive, you can go online and Google it, and it's huge. But when it's full, it's done. And they're not building any more uh, landfills in Vermont anytime soon, as far as I know. So we're trying to make that last as long as possible. Also, um, there seems to be, not only in this country, but, but uh, internationally, uh, of course, they're way ahead of us in terms of composting and recycling. But the sense that they're, uh, a lot of what we dispose of has another life. even. This new battery law uh, it, it, it is set up because all the pretty much all the materials in, it, in an alkaline battery, if they can be broken down, they can be reused again. And I have one fun-filled fact that I always quote: uh, In 2010, the Container Recycling Institute studied uh, did a study, and they were. 36 billion, with a B, aluminum cans landfilled every year in this country. And they have a scrap value of $600 million. Mm -hmm. And during the 20 years of scrapped aluminum cans worth, uh, the, of this study, during 20 years, scrapped aluminum cans worth over $12 billion on the 2010 market. And it was, it's enough to rebuild the entire US commercial airline fleet four times. So that's, that is just aluminum cans that we toss out instead of, uh, you know, putting in the recycling. Um, the other thing is, um, I think I pretty much, yeah, I think I pretty much covered all of that. Um, so a quick rundown on the timeline. Um, July 1st, 2015, which was a year ago, all recyclables were banned from the landfill. Um, plastics one and two, you all probably recycle more than just plastics one and two, but plastics one and two are mandated uh, to be kept out of the landfill. Um, uh, if you have your trash picked up at your house and your hauler picks up a bag and here's beer cans or bottles, he can leave it there, he or she can leave it there. Um, because he can take that load to a transfer station and his whole load can be rejected if there are recyclables in the trash. Um, also, and if you take your trash to the landfill, I was talking to uh, a fellow at the Hartford transfer station today and he's there at the gatehouse and he said he thinks his guess would be that at least, 
I don't know how accurate this is, but he said he thought at least 50% of the people coming in to bring their trash are throwing their recyclables out in the trash. And there just aren't enough people to monitor it, and it's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. But um, So you don't pay them. That's economics. You don't pay the people. They're, they're paid quite well. There just aren't enough of them. So, you know, they can't be everywhere to, to, to police everybody. But even with the fee to, per bag, people are not bothering to... They don't, them. interestingly oh. enough. I mean, it's, the thing is, the whole thing is set up so that you pay for your trash and you don't pay for your recyclables. Mm -hmm. or you, and um, it's just people... I talked to a young woman today in Windsor who's on the library board with me, and I won't mention her name. Um, she said, you know, they have two little kids, and she said, you're going to hate to hear this, but we didn't. Re we have two little kids, and we just started recycling uh, when the law was passed a year ago. And it's just, for you know, there are a number of reasons why people don't do it. Um, so that was 2015. This past July 1st, um, the ban on leaf and yard waste and clean wood began. So none of that can go in the landfill. Clean wood meaning any kind of, uh, it can be, you know, trees or logs or lumber, but it doesn't have any, it can have paint or stain or any treatments on it. Um, and that includes glue. So, um, and the Hartford Transfer Station is, has started a clean wood pile. But this is all new and people are, are trying their best to, to get used to it. But, so that's what's just happened. Um, in 20, let's see, and then, and then, okay, so then 2017, July 1st, 2017, haulers and transfer stations must provide pickup of food waste at your house, or if you haul your, want to haul your food waste to a transfer station, the transfer station must provide that service. July 1st, 2020, everybody in the state of Vermont is required to sort their food scraps from their trash. And their food scraps will then be banned from the landfill. And that makes, it, that's going to be the biggest hurdle for all of us. But that also makes a lot of sense because about 70%, 65-70% of your trash that you throw out every, every week, the weight of it, is made up of, of, of food waste. So that's, uh, and, and getting back to the idea of a valuable resource, food is a valuable resource. It's, it, um, I don't know if you, probably some of you have read the, art, the articles about the unexpected consequences of uh, grocery stores having to sort their food scraps out, is that the food pantries all over the state are just being loaded with this food that's perfectly good that the stores were throwing in the dumpster. So that's terrific. Um, let's see. Um, I also, in, in terms yeah. of um, food scraps, like I'm just thinking about here at the library, yeah. so we're, you know, a staff of seven. Uh, um, what, what, how will that um, impact on, like, small businesses in, um, and disposal of food waste? Well, a lot of small businesses, I think, are, um, like, we have an office of eight people, and everybody packs it in and packs it mm -hmm. out. We actually do have a compost bucket, but mm -hmm. that's because um, the two, uh, we two solid waste people are you know, adamant about composting. But um, it will impact you uh, unless somebody on the staff wants, you know, if you want to take turns taking it home, um, but you will eventually um, be able to put it out and have it picked up. And oh. these are, um, mm -hmm. when you were saying to me before the meeting started, a lot of <laughs> questions about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows quite how it's going to work. Um, one of the stipulations of the law is that if there's not a commercial composting facility within 20 miles of where you're generating it, you do not have to compost. Or you do not have to sort your food scraps. That's a valid law until 2020 and then you have to sort food scraps no matter whether there are uh, there's a composting facility around or not. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that um, Grow Compost, which is a company up in Moortown, um, great company, they have just started to 
uh, they're in the planning stages of collaborating with Casella, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if this is public knowledge, but it, it, it should be, and it certainly will be. Um, they're going to start collecting commercial food scraps in the Upper Valley. Mm -hmm. They're going to start with larger generators, and you know, with the hopes that they'll, you know, somebody else will tag along and and be be able to offer the the curbside for for homes. I encourage people wherever I can to compost. Um, at home. Um, there, there, there's a lot of resistance to it. There's the ick factor we call. Um, there's the animal factor that people are worried about. And um, Kat Buxton, who we mentioned earlier, who uh, um, is, uh, I just think she's a fantastic resource. Her theory is that if you do it well, it doesn't smell. And yeah, but doing it well is a problem. Well, doing it right. I mean, that's not easy. Right. So you need, you know, we can have Kat come and do a, a uh, workshop or I can do a workshop when I get my, my, cert, my official badge from the extension service. Um, but it, it can be done. There are lots of different ways to do it. Um, it's just re restaurants in particular are um, uh, quite resistant to it because they all they don't have the space to do it in their kitchens. They're all having to retrofit, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's going to be a big issue. Yes, that comes up um, all the time. Um, again, you can't do meat and bones at your at your home composting because the 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 heat has to get up to 144 degrees to kill all the, the pathogens. Um, there that's there is no easy answer to that. If at some point um, there, there can be a commercial composting venture in the Upper Valley uh, where your material can go, you can, you can take it there and, the, and it will, all of that will break down. Um, but in the meantime... In the, in the meantime, it has to go in, in the trash. Or the crows. Or feed it to the crows. I, you know, I got in trouble once for saying that I save mine in the freezer and I take it out where nobody lives and I feed it to the coyotes. And then, you know, somebody said, oh, that's great. You know, what if somebody really does live right nearby and you're bringing the coyotes? So there's coyotes and bears and, and, and there is no, there's no easy answer to that. I don't, I don't have a, a better, a better answer. Um, you know, some people dig a hole and bury it. And, um, just it's a it's a question that hasn't been completely solved. Um, I'm, what I'm hoping is that that um, grow compost will be able to expand beyond commercial pickup. Uh, does anybody know Bob Sandberg? Lives up he lives in Corinth and he's in his 70s I think and he's been composting for a long time on his farm and. Uh, he picks up commercial, some commercial entities in the Upper Valley, but he's, um, don't think he really wants to expand any. Um, I will tell you on the positive side that every school I go in, I'm also, I also do outreach work in the next district south. So my, my territory runs from Bellows Falls to West Fairley. And every school I go in, they are either composting already or they are beginning composting, or they're, but it's on everybody's radar because they, they, they know they have to do it. And Thetford Elementary School is the gold standard. Um, so there be, you know, there's a whole generation of, of children who are gonna be learning how to compost and coming home and saying, mom and dad, guess what I learned and let's do this too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the initiatives that are not connected with Act 148, which I, I briefly touched on earlier, um, and that is the Paint Stewardship Program. Um, what I feel bad because there were this 98% of the people at the collection on, on Saturday in Woodstock that didn't know what to do with their paint. Um, the Paint Stewardship Program was passed in 2014. It is run by uh, an organization called Paint Care. And Paint Care has set up 
paint drop-off locations all over the state. Norwich Transfer Station is one of them. Hartford Transfer Station is another one. Britain's in Taftsville, Heartland, uh, Woodstock True Value. There's a True Value up in South Royalton, but they're all over the place. And if you, um, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna hand out a sheet at the end which has the uh, contact information. But paint care, um, you can take your paint to a paint care drop-off location any time of the year. You don't have to wait for a hazardous waste collection. In fact, we would prefer that you don't. Um, they do have a limit on how much they can take at one time, but what happens is they have these giant boxes called Gaylords in the back room and they're lined and you drop off your five gallons of paint and they put it in the box and when the Gaylord is full they call paint care and paint, paint care comes and takes it away and a lot of it is actually reused um, so which is great. Um, the other stipulation uh, which you can find in this brochure as well which I'll give you is that if the can is leaking or if it doesn't have a label, it is considered hazardous waste. Uh, the paint, the stores don't, just don't want to want to deal with it. I mean, if you wrap it, I spoke to the paint care guy today. He said, if, you, if your can is leaking, it's been around for a while, you can wrap it up well, and they will take it at a store, but they would prefer not to. They just don't want to deal with, with the mess. Um, dry paint. If, if the paint is completely dry, it can go in the trash. That's what I did with mine. Yeah, or you can dry it. Yeah. So the so the days of putting kitty litter in your latex paint are over. You don't have to do that. The, this paint care includes, and it, again, it'll tell you on here. It includes paints and stains, uh, latex oil. In fact, when you go to buy a gallon of paint now, you're paying seventy-five plus cents a can to support this program. Mm -hmm. So make use of it. Um, so that's the paint care. Um, let's see, the next one, which people seem to be, uh, doesn't seem to be out there very well in terms of um, general, general public knowledge, is the uh, recycle, the, um, the recycling program, the battery recycling program, which began January 1st of this year. And you now can recycle all batteries in the state of Vermont. You are not required to. But again, all of these batteries that we've been chucking in the landfill for all these years are breaking down and leaching out all sorts of um, you know, chemicals and whatever. And even an alkaline battery can be broken down and the materials in it can be reused. So all of your batteries are recyclable. Again, the Norwich Transfer Station is a battery, a, a battery recycling collection um, place. And I think... How, what do you feel about the hearing aid batteries? Hearing aid batteries. I just learned something interesting um, from Todd Ellis, who is the call to recycle um, rep in the state of Vermont. I was told that button batteries uh, all have to be, and I set up a, if anybody's been to the, the Norwich Transfer Station and been in the battery shed, I set up a system there and it's, you know, please read the signs. I put buckets with different labels on them. And when you come in with, with button cell batteries, there's, I have a roll of uh, duct tape there. You're supposed to take your batteries and they have to, the terminals have to be taped because when in shipping, if they, the, the, they touch, they can start smoldering. So you put your button batteries on this thing and then you fold it over. But I just learned something, that hearing aid batteries, according to Todd Ellis, do not have to be taped. So you can bring a whole Ziploc bag full of, of those batteries and they will go in a call to recycle box, which I meant to bring tonight. And then I pick those up when they're full and I take them to UPS and ship them. However, coin cell batteries, which are the size of a quarter, those do have to be taped. So I, I would um, not urge you, but strongly suggest that you go online and, and um, read about how to do batteries. Again, it's confusing. And I find what's happening as long as I've been doing this, is that 
we are being forced as a uh, society to start really focusing on the stuff that we buy and bring into our homes because it's all costing more and more and more to get rid of and it's being recycled, more and more of it is. And I'm having to learn how to read a battery and tell whether it's, you know, if it's a rechargeable battery, it has to be taped. If it's an alkaline battery, it doesn't. If it's a button battery, it goes in a bag. If it's a coin battery, it has to be taped. Um, and it's a process and people, I know everybody is really busy and they, they just don't want to take the time, but I would, I would ask you to just be aware of that. Um, you can either tape, this sign here, which I find confusing, I'm happy to explain it to anybody, but this is online, this is on the Call to Recycle uh, website. And what it does is it tells you what kind of battery, and then uh, this little arrow points to, you know, if it's a nine, if it's an alkaline and it's nine volt or less, you don't have to tape it. If it's over nine volts, you do. So you just have to sort of stop and, and look at this and figure it so out. So the but ones that have to be taped are because they're going to smolder and... Yeah. You can either put them in, um, in you can either tape them or you can put them in a, um, in a little plastic bag. The call to recycle boxes at the Norwich transfer station have little, little plastic bags and you can wrap, wrap them up and stick them in. Yeah. Automotive batteries? Uh, cars? Car batteries. Um, are, should, are really are not part of this program. They're the only ones that are. They should go back to a, a service station or a drive. <laughs> Hartford, excuse me, I just dropped one off at the Hartford station this morning um, that came, that somebody dropped off at the Hazardous Waste Collection on Saturday. But they, so Hartford does take them, but if you can take them to a service station or a garage, much better. I'm new to the area. Um, sure. The um, Hazardous Waste Collections, how frequent are those? <laughs> We just had our last oh, no. one. <laughs> bad gas. We've got some bad gas that came out of the uh, lawnmower tank. Yeah. Um, normally, in, in this part of the state, I know between the Southern Windsor District and Greater Upper Valley, um, we Greater Upper Valley holds one in June and one in September. Mm -hmm. The one in June is always at Hartford. The one in September moves from different towns. The ones in um, and you, those are the ones that would be accessible to you. Okay. Um, so if you can just hang on to it, um, you probably don't want to, but, uh, or you, you know, you might take it. There are a lot of places that, uh, I mean, Hartford, the Hartford transfer station uh, is heated by um, used motor oil. Mm -hmm. uh, so they collect it. Also, um, um, there, there's a gas station that's right across Route 5 from the VA hospital, it's Dave's or... Bob's. Thank you, Bob's. He, <laughs> he takes it as well. Um, and so, the, you know, they're, uh, on our website, I think I have a list of different places that will take it, but I think bad gas is probably hazardous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you need to wait for that. Um, all right, I'm zeroing in here. Batteries, one more. Um, and I just want to talk about um, electronics, which has been around for several years. So I think most of you probably, if you're at this meeting tonight, you probably know something about electronics. But again, I've got information here. Um, electronics recycling has been around since 2011. And um, again, all this information is online and there are links on our website to it. But um, all of your computers, computer peripherals, and televisions are all recyclable at no charge through the state program. Um, Norwich, I think Norwich, I should know, it does, okay. Norwich has a, is a drop-off place. Um, Best Buy, Best Buy Home works. Depot, Staples, um, Hartford, um, so there are options for all these all these things, and you can always call me at the office because I love talking to people and giving out information. So um, other electronics like toasters and irons and those are recyclable, but uh, you you will you might have to pay for something, pay something for those at, at Hartford. So 
Aye. He would take her to Hartford and not Norwich. Um, if, if you took a toaster to Norwich, they probably, um, Bill would probably throw it in the, um, in the scrap metal. Yeah. Oh, which, which is mostly what it is. Yeah. A toaster is not electronic. No. But you're talking about electronics are computers and old phones and um, <coughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, Hartford will, <coughs> Hartford will take phones and answering machines and not charge for them. That's, I don't think that that's statewide because they, they could if they wanted to charge for those because they're not a computer peripheral and they're not a television. But they very generously, you know, do not charge for those things. Just simple electric appliances. Yeah. Thank you. Appliances is a good word. Um, I have, I think, gone through everything that I wanted to talk about and I am happy to answer questions. Jillian, I know you have some. <laughs> Fire um, away. So Lisa was talking this morning about, uh, was this, is this in Barry, were you saying? Yeah. Yeah, a place where you can bring all kinds, I mean anything that you can imagine, like toothpaste tubes. Yeah, the additional recyclable bags. center in Barry. Do you know about that? I do not. Okay. Okay. That was going to be my question is is there any are there any plans for something like that in the Upper Valley area anytime soon? Not or? not that I know of it. What's okay. it called? The, the additional recyclable center. It's right in downtown Barry, but you have to be a member of the I live I work here, but I live in Chelsea, so you have to be a member of the Central Vermont so sure. Waste District. But they take I don't know where their market is for these things, but they take an incredible amount of interesting um, things which I formerly didn't think about as being recyclable. Yeah, I hate throwing the toothpaste tubes. Yeah. Away. They used to be made of right. tin or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of the things that, um, that Vermont suffers from and that we run into um, frequently as a, as, a, as a state when we meet together with the different district managers is that um, our economy of scale is so small that in, if you lived in a metropolitan area um, you, you would be able to recycle a lot more, but there, you know, a lot. Most of the companies don't want to pay to have an 18-wheeler truck drive up and pick up, you know, two boxes of maple tubing. So it either has to be backhauled somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's frustrating because we're we are. I mean, we are, um, in some ways, on the forefront of you know we're we, we're we're quite green thinking in Vermont, mm -hmm. and um, we're 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 hamstrung by by that, um, the fact that we're so small and we're so far away. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, cousins who live on the North Shore of Boston and they, uh, their town is uh, rated, I think, the, the, the best town-wide composting in, in east of the Mississippi or something. And it's because it's, uh, you know, you can roll it down to the end of your driveway and a truck comes along and it's all taken to a beautiful horse farm a mile away and they've got windrows and machinery and so um, anyway. What they're doing in New York City? Who I knows what they're I doing in New York, New York City. They've, you know, they've, they've tried to do, I think they, didn't they try to ban um, styrofoam yeah. or something and then the lobbyists came in and I, I don't know. I, I, I yeah. used to live down there, but yeah. that's Montes or any of our city. What about styrofoam? Is that collected? I'm so glad you asked. I asked about <coughs> styrofoam. Oh. So this has a number six on it. Mm -hmm. Polystyrene. And I love to go into schools and ask, you know, is this recyclable? And, um, I, and I'm going to get on my high horse for a minute. This is not recyclable. Again, if you lived in metropolitan New York or New Jersey or San Francisco, there are facilities that will recycle this. I don't know what they do with it, but this stuff, if you can avoid it, avoid it like the plague. Um, I spoke to a guy who was on the Rochester 
Fast Squad years ago, and he said that they did an experiment with this and they lit a coffee cup on fire inside a room in the station and the fumes were so bad that they had to, they all had to evacuate. Yeah. It's just toxic, toxic, toxic. And if you put a coffee cup, if you, or if you, you know, went to McDonald's this morning, I don't think McDonald's uses these anymore. Sorry, McDonald's. Um, but <laughs> I was thinking today as I was driving around, wow, can they say, make a point about the styrofoam? I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to a library. So let's say that, um, in 14 whatever when Shakespeare was writing Midsummer Night's Dream okay and they're all at the Old Globe and they're uh, sitting around a table doing a read-through of this play and they're all um, they've all brought their lunch in one of these or you know <laughs> coffee cup you know actors drink yeah. a lot of coffee um, and then um, fast forward 500 years and they discover the ruins of the, the Globe Theater and along with the ruins, they find piles and piles of styrofoam. This, would, if you had a coffee cup, in, if you had your coffee in a styrofoam cup this morning, and I'm sure none of you did, um, it will be 500 years from now, it will be pretty much intact when somebody digs it up. And um, to say nothing of the fact that when you, you know, if you tear this, it gives off gas. Um, when it burns, it gives off gas. Um, it's just nasty stuff, and I'm sorry, styrofoam folks, but that's not true. Help make it illegal. It, make there are it cities who are who are who are like New York tried to ban this. I think San Francisco probably has tried to ban it. But the the you know the lobbyists, the corporations, are uh, just have zillions of dollars, and they they can mm. railroad the. I'm uh, pretty yeah. sure there are two things. Sorry. Paris has just banned all. Plastic yes. plates and plastic cups. I read that. Um, but what I wanted to say is my son told me that Brattleboro has an industrial recycling operation where they do take number six. Okay. And if you have uh, number six, which is all the styrofoam and the plastics, uh, like plastic cups and so forth, you would have to go to an industrialized center yep. like Brattleboro. Right. So if the carbon footprint that it would take for you to you know drive all of your neighbors styrofoam down to Brattleboro it's great I'm, I'm happy they're doing it but again it's the like you know, how are you gonna get the, the, the cost that it, the, just the money cost and the carbon cost of, of it's not effective for us but. yeah yeah so avoid it whenever you can and you had a question and I'll get oh, to you great. so I was at the transfer station and the guy at the hopper for the recycling was putting the styrofoam from the trash can into the yeah. zero sort. Yeah, so, yikes. You know, I need to make a note of that because I'm going there on Wednesday and uh, I can, yeah. yeah. because um, there used to be a separate thing for styrofoam and I said, where's, where's the separate thing for styrofoam? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, it's always been here. And he said, is there a, um, the triangle on it? I said, yeah, and he goes, oh, that all goes into yeah. recycling. That's that's and I said, well, that's new to me because I was told that I always have it separate. Yeah. And he said, no, that if it's a recycled thing on it, it goes in the recycled mm -hmm. thing. No, that is that is number six. That is not. So right. he said, and no, he said any recycle if it has any recycled yeah. thing on it, because yeah. I had a chunk of styrofoam that came in a box, and he said that goes in trash. He said the, if it's got the Thing on it that goes in recycling. Okay, that I I'm, I'm quite sure that is that is not correct, and, and uh, I'll I'll make I'll I'll check with Bill on on uh, on Wednesday. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I was late, and you may have already um, answered this. I probably did. earlier part of your uh, presentation. Um, thank you for presenting. Yeah. Um, I am wondering. Um, I know about um, Casilla Zero Sort facility. I've been there. Um, but I am wondering if now all of the Zero Sort that they are collecting, um, are they able to find markets for it? That's a really good question. Uh, the markets, as you may or may not know, for recycling are in the tank. Right. 
Um, and what does that mean in the tank? That means that, that there's no market. Bottom. It's bottomed out. And it's now costing haulers more money to get rid of the recycling than it, they're, they're, some haulers are paying to get rid of recycling. And it's a really, um, I don't want to get my personal views in on this, but it's a, it's a, it's a really difficult situation. Um, I was told by somebody from the Chittenden Solid Waste District at a meeting about a month ago that Chittenden has just stopped taking number black, uh, number, bla or all black mm -hmm. plastic, it's number seven. Uh, like be plant pots? Yeah, plant pots and clamshells that, you know, you buy a roast mm -hmm. chicken in the store. Mm -hmm. um, because black plastic can only made, be made into more black plastic and it's not economical so that's in you know Chittenden County I believe all of that plastic is going in the trash um, and um, I will put my two cents in about um, nobody asked me but um, I'm not a big fan of single stream recycling um, single, single stream by the way is the generic name for it zero sort is Casella's patented um, copyrighted name that they use, but it, the term, the generic term is single stream. And I just think that, um, I know why they did it, because they're trying to boost people to recycle, and there was a lot of recycling. Uh, it's a lot easier for people to throw everything in one bin. Uh, it takes up less space, it takes up less time, but when you go to market a stack of white office paper, which has had coffee and ketchup spilled on it, uh, in a recycling bin, it's the, that the quality is degraded. And, um, but they also said originally, I don't know if they're still saying it, that one of the reasons for doing it was because the recyclables that they were collecting when they were picking up aluminum or some other um, sorted material, it was contaminated. Mm -hmm. And so it was more cost efficient for them to do the sorting of everything. Otherwise, they'd have things that were rejected further down the line. Yeah, I think and that's so true. That was their rationale. Yeah, well, and, and from that standpoint, it, it makes sense. Um, I, I, in a previous job, I worked, um, my job was to go to different cities around the country and go into these huge MRFs, these material recovery facilities and put on a white Tyvek suit and sort through uh, days worth of municipal trash, pulling recyclables out, or pulling recyclables out of recyclables and sorting them and saying, you know, this is how much you're generating. Uh, the most fun was spending five days on the mall in Washington, D.C., sorting through all the public trash barrels in August. <laughs> but, so, um, if you, if just on a, a sort of a side note, the, uh, these MRFs, material recovery facilities, Casella runs one in Rutland, and if you Google it, you can see a, a YouTube video of the way it works. They're absolutely astounding. Does it have to do with blowing air and... Blowing wind? air and yeah. tanks, and mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons that you can't put caps, they don't want you to put bottle caps or plastic cutlery in because anything that's got a... Oh, I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. No, no, no. Well, and the reason is because the um, anything that's smaller than a two-inch diameter falls through the grating in the mm -hmm. conveyor belts mm -hmm. and the, it's, you're also not supposed to, that's why you're not supposed to put plastic bags, grocery bags mm -hmm. in. I mean, they can go back to a grocery store, but they jam up the works and the whole machine stops and it, people get hurt, you know, the workers get hurt going in and trying to extract them. Uh, um, yeah. and it, so the last time I had talked to Casella about the, um, you know, the caps issue, they said if the caps were on the um, container you leave it on itself, the model. leave them on, but once they're s separated, they, once you know, they're free, they don't free floating, them. yeah. Right, yeah. they don't want them. So you can't kind of leave them on. What if you put them yeah, in leave them on or throw, throw them in the trash, but don't yeah, throw them separately the in the recycling. Right. Yeah. I wonder if you can, I have all those Parmesan cheese, we eat a lot of Parmesan cheese, the, the sprinkle kind, and that's what I put all the batteries in. So oh, I have yeah. containers like that, yeah. so I save them up. 
Yeah. You can do the same thing. Good idea. Mm -hmm. um, yes, ma'am. So to continue with that question, is Casella stockpiling? Are they storing all the stuff that they're taking that they don't have markets for? Or are they landfilling it? I can't answer that question. I don't know that for sure. But the, the problem, the, 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 and, and you probably could call them and they would give you an honest answer, but the, prob the big problem is that China no longer wants all of our recyclables. Mm -hmm. So the system is backed up all the way. Well, India still takes them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yes? Uh, I, I made a list of things that I keep, I always come across, and I don't know if it would be better to go through it later when... Uh, well, fire away. Right. Give me a couple. Okay. So uh, paper stuff, like um, address labels that get sent, you know, as a promotional thing, and it has that heavy uh, adhesive backing on them. I never know if I put the... If it's there. stuck to the actual piece of mail? Well, no, this is like a... Uh, somebody might that. send it as a promotion, they'll have a bunch of address labels for me to Oh, 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 no, trash. 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 Uh, it, because right. it's, good, it's on a plastic back. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Receipt paper, I've, I've heard it's coated with some sort of weird, um, it's a kind of a glossy the, almost. And the thermal kind? Yeah, mean? Like, um, yeah um, if it's coated, that trash. trash too. Okay. Um, oak tag, um, like a manila folder kind of paper. Um, uh, it might have a flat folder. Kind of. Oh, I think that's okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then that heavy, like uh, those folios, they're like accordion folds, and maybe dark. They artists might use to. Yep, I, mean, I, I, I think that's all right. Okay. Yep. Uh, post heavy poster board kind of stuff. Um, um, poster board, yes. Foam core, no. Foam core, no. Okay. Yeah. Wrapping paper. Um, as long as it's not metallic or it has okay. you know shiny glittery stuff yep. on it, um, and and that. That goes back and forth. The other, you know, I get confused about this stuff because the rules change, mm -hmm. and and it also depends uh -huh. on what town you live in uh -huh. and who's who's picking up your recycling and where it's ending up. The facility dictates what, but I would say yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I um, well, I know like the tissue paper tubes can can go in, mm -hmm. but, um, but sometimes it's a it's a really heavy. Um, almost like rigid um, oh, yeah. cardboard kind of thing. It's not corrugated, mm -hmm. but it's like a super thick It's like a box, box something that a poster is shipping? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's fine. That's okay, okay. I'll um, probably get start getting calls from them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to trap you, I just, I just look at these yeah. things every week and think, what do I do? Okay. Um, construction paper, like, yep. yeah, that's good, okay. Um, and I know you already mentioned some lids, like the uh, sort of lids stay on, that's better than leaving them off. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I get like takeout sometimes that, or you might get chicken salad and something, and there's a number, like two on the bottom, but the lid seems to be a different material, mm -hmm. it, and I don't know, do I throw the lid out? Or that's yeah. that's a tough. I can't find a number on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I personally would put it in with my recycling. Okay, and yeah. it'll get sorted out yeah. um, again. Casella may call me tomorrow. You're <laughs> <laughs> fine, but um, that that get, that leads, that makes me think of a good point. But one of the other reasons that I'm I'm not a big fan of single stream is that. It makes us all, myself included, lazy. I mean, you you look at something, you say, "Oh, I think that'll go in." Whereas mm -hmm. before, you might have said, uh, "This doesn't really comply with anything on the list that I'm looking at." I I just threw out of you know these stupid spray bottles. The bottle is good, but the spray things apparatus they break all the time. Yeah. And those are the things that like I can recycle. Them Place and battery. battery. Yeah. I've got to research that. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, my son was spending last year in New Haven, and he was told that they could throw any glass, plastic, um, metal, paper, everything all together in the recycling, and that the containers could even have food in them still, and that would be, be okay. And did you address this earlier? Because my understanding was that we really had to clean everything out pretty well before recycling it. That's my understanding. I know Casella does not want food. food. Leftover in like the containers. Our peanut butter. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
It's really hard to clean out. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, should we be putting these things through the dishwasher before we put them? I mean, how clean are you talking? No. Uh, no. no. And, you know, there's the other thing. Here, here we are in the midst of a, of a drought, right? <laughs> and how much water are we using to clean? I just cleaned out a, I bought my, you know, my bulk uh, peanut butter at the Upper Valley Food Co-op, and I spent, I, you know, I used a bin, bunch of water cleaning out mm -hmm. the peanut butter, but I'm going to reuse the jar. But I would say, um, scrape it out as best you can, maybe run it quickly through the rinse, but, you know, don't, do not run it through the dishwasher. Um, that's, that's overkill. So what about like oil, something that you buy olive oil and it's difficult to clean, do you? No, I just, you, I would, you know, the, the, the machinery that that olive oil bottle is going to go through is going to clean okay. the stuff out. Get out as much as you can. Yeah. I um, had a spray of uh, silicone and one of WD-40 and half, both are half full and they both are like, I, nothing, I can't, I put pins in them, I couldn't get them out. I could, took them to the Norwich guy and I go, is this garbage or is, because I was told some aerosol sprays can go and recycle, mm -hmm. like your Pam or something like that, that's okay because that was for food. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, those have to go to hazardous waste because there's still oil inside them. Yeah, if, a, so, if an aerosol paint can or something other than Pam has, has material in it, it's hazardous waste. If the can is empty, completely empty, it can go as scrap metal. Oh, scrap metal, yeah. okay, yeah. all right, okay. Jillian, do you have more or? Well, the gentleman I'm sitting next to is asking a lot of, of those really nitty gritty questions that I had, and I, I was. Well, keep going. I, yeah, you know, I don't have a time to keep it. What time is it? Uh, it's uh, almost eight. Oh my gosh, the library closes. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I'll back up and just ask um, a really quick question, and maybe you'll have time to stay after. To <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> happy to stay. I'm happy to okay. stay as long as anybody has. Um, so before I moved here last year, uh, I lived in Switzerland for two years, and oh, they have this. Don't compare us to Switzerland. Well, no, no. I'm just saying. I, so there are things that we're already doing that are similar, such as you know, charging for trash. Um, and sort of like disincentivizing people to um, throw things in the trash while recycling remains free and <laughs> relatively easy. Um, and I saw that there were some ways in which, you know, and if I may stereotype for a little bit, I think that the people in the city where we're living are very orderly and like, um, you know, law abiding people, but you could still see that there were kind of these holes in the system because you would see these public service announcements everywhere like, um, there were signs on the train of like a guy sneakily throwing his household trash into the train um, trash cans and saying like you can get a 250 franc fine for this. Mm -hmm. um, don't flush your, your garbage down the toilet. Apparently a lot of people <laughs> were doing that because they didn't want to pay to throw it away. Um, and there are also some really, really, so that they've come up with these really strong and what might seem to us kind of drastic or even invasive ways to get people to comply with this, like, um, you know, if they can go through your recycles and if you have, uh, I think someone had a, a plastic bottle, this made the news because people were outraged, he had a plastic bottle uh, squished flat accidentally mixed in with his paper recycling and he was fined 250 francs. Um, uh, Swiss. Yes. <laughs> Another, and so, you know, you're, they're entitled to go through and track you down, you know, based on who it says you are and, and to find you. And another city, they actually, um, this is true, they hired biker gangs to, like, hide in the bushes <laughs> and jump out and scare people when they tried to throw their recycle, or, or their general household trash into the recyclable collection containers. I wouldn't mind being one of those. <laughs> right. So I'm just wondering, like, are there any, from, <laughs> in the bigger picture, like, what are some of the ways that um, the Solid Waste Management District and, and you know, maybe the, the state or whatever level this is being done can do to sort of help guide people along and to figure out what's the best way to do all this but maybe not necessarily reserving to like literally looking through people's garbage. Slapping people, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, 
I get really, fr I was really frustrated on Saturday and thinking, you know, all these people are coming through here and they don't know about the new law about batteries. And, you know, that falls back to me. I mean, I'm the outreach guy, right? But um, the, the, the state, the Agency of Natural Resources are, you know, they're having to um, make these laws happen that are passed by the legislature, but there's no money involved. And so they say to each of the solid waste districts, it's your job to educate people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I'm glad all of you are here tonight. I actually you know, asked you to have the CATD come because I thought we could get a few more people um, you know, in on it. Um, but I would be, I might throw that back to you and ask you know, all of you, what, where do you get your information do you, if you have ideas um, in how I can get the information out, I mean, I do, I do listservs, and we have a Facebook page, and um, you know, I try to get an occasional article in, in the Valley News. Um, I don't Twitter. Uh, have thought about doing a blog. I've not done one, but um, yeah. Why don't you put an article in the Valley News? You know, I've tried tried in the Valley News. They they really like. Uh, they like something that's, you know, big newsy happening. You know, not something that's. Um, well, it is a newsy happening that recycled. They had a great article. Recycled something. your batteries. They had a great article. They did. Sunday. Yeah. I thought it was very good. Yeah, and I haven't even gotten gotten around to reading it yet. Uh, but Sunday, but, no, I haven't either. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, just. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. And one of the frust one of the other frustrations is that there's no. Um, there is no way to enforce it. Usually, I'm surprised nobody asked me that question tonight. You know, yeah. I thought about this for years because I came from Houston, where my, uh, I did community gardening, and so composting, and and I always felt really, you know, I drove out, way out of my way to go recycle before we had. We, then we had bins mm -hmm. when we picked it up, and eventually they were single stream, like what you were talking about. Um, but anyway, I. I, I was thinking, like, at one point I was frustrated because people would put compost up their trees. It's called volcano composting. It's supposed to be more like an island at oh, all. Mulch. And it rocks the trees. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a felony in one state. I read on the, I think it's the University of Iowa has a website about composting for, for you know, mulching around mm -hmm. the tree. And um, anyway, so I had this idea. What about if the... The Girl Scouts or my kids should be doing stuff and informing Home Depot or someplace like that. But what about partnering with big companies or grocery stores mm -hmm. or something like that? Because you know we're all in. You know we were outraged when there's water problems, water quality problems, but we're creating it by not being aware about this. So you know, yeah. cost saving. And you know, I mean, it is like you said, it's hard on people who have to pay if they're financially strapped to have to pay for their trash. Yeah. So maybe the solutions could be, you know, um, like you said, with awareness. But it's t tough if you're working two jobs or you're, yeah. you know, to, you know, so through kids at schools, it seems like an obvious thing, but maybe through some more, you know, labor. I don't know, I always thought Home Depot should be a whole lot more interested in selling good quality compost than what they, yeah. you know, um, the trash a, that they put out, that chemical kind of stuff is probably destroying the soil yeah. instead of improving it. You know. That's a big, that's a big issue. Wait. Yeah. But it, it, it's a great idea. Um, so we need to stop. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm happy to stay. You're yes. probably closing up. But I'm, I'm staying, so yeah, we're happy to stay, but I just wanted to make this breaking point in, in case sure. some people wanted to leave, because I know we said we'd only go until 8. But yes, thank you for agreeing to stay a little right. later, because I think we probably all have some more questions. But.